uh, and hear it well. that came through okay I think it did it seemed smooth on my end how about all the way over in the Netherlands did it come across okay amazing huh it's an amazing world we live in <laughs> amazing world we live in so uh it was such a pleasure to put that together I want to thank Forrest of course and Mr. Leitzinger for asking me to be part of this uh, I've been playing, it's really, I'm celebrating my fourth anniversary now on my Leitzinger bassoon. Um, I switched to it four years ago and have not looked back. Um, and I'm thrilled to be playing on it. Uh, the class we're going to do today has to do, it's some that some of you may have seen me do this class or a version of it before. I apologize for repeating it, but I think it's such an important topic to me that I, I want to share it with uh, more people. And that has to do with this idea of singing through your instrument. And both, we'll talk a little bit about production for a short amount of time, playing into the instrument, how one goes about what one should be considering in making a good sound. And then, and much of that relates to what singers do, and then the concept is, which I did since the time I was a student, my teacher, Stephen Maxim, played in the Metropolitan Opera for many years. 
and he modeled much of his thinking and teaching on the great singers that he accompanied in the orchestra. He observed them, he would speak with them. So he considered himself a student of some of these world famous singers and wanted to apply that to his own playing. And then we as his students benefited from his own journey in this world. So since I was a student, I was listening to and trying to copy great singers. The first tenor that um, I was following back in, this would be in the 1970s, I'm that old, is that uh, was in the man named UC Bierling, who was an amazing tenor uh, and sang many roles at the Metropolitan and around the world. And he had a, and my teacher, Stephen Maxim, thought just his voice was amazing. Members of the opera, there were nights when Mr. Bierling would sing, where my teacher would say that people in the orchestra would sometimes forget to play because they would listen to him <laughs> forget they're supposed to come in because his singing was so captivating. And then later, not too much later, I f came upon Fritz Wunderlich, the great tenor who unfortunately died way too young. And his one of his counterparts, Hermann Prey, who I always felt sang a lot like Wunderlich, but in a baritone. And of course, the other baritone who we all revered was Dietrich Fischer Dieskau. So between the tenor sound of Björling and Wunderlich and the deeper sound of, of let's say, a Dieskau and Hermann Prey, those were singers that uh, affected me and still do greatly. And so um, I've incorporated this teaching, much of it inherited from my teacher, but I, I imagine I've added a few things, but I'm so indebted to my own teacher that I'm happy to give him credit for the whole thing. But uh, this is a method of thinking. Um, so what we're going to do is start first with my a little presentation. Some of you have seen some of it um, before if you've come to classes or now with the Zoom classes uh, this past year and a half. And uh, then from there, we'll get to work with the students. And the way we set this class up, I know two of them are here. I don't know if the third one showed up, but uh, we have two, which is plenty. We have two young ladies who are sisters the Shen sisters who live not far from me on Long Island. They are not my students. They did study with someone who is in the Morelli family, Dr. Shelley Monroe Huang, who is on this call with her dad, I could see. Hello, Mr. Monroe, good to see you. And, um, and so uh, the, these young ladies think of me as Papa Frank, you know, I'm sort of grandpa. So uh, I'm happy to to think of them that way. So they're going to play for us. And what I like to do in this type of class is we they decided they offered up a piece, which were great ideas, the, the repertoire. I then suggested to them an aria to listen to, sung by Fritz Wunderlich. Two Mozart arias. Oh no, one Mozart aria. I lied because the other fellow's doing the other Mozart aria if he is here. Uh, and the other for the sans sans. Uh, first movement, who is which is being done by Annabelle, um, I recommended that she listen to an extremely captivating part of a recording of Jesse Norman singing very famous aria from Samson and Delilah. And really the middle section that she gets to after the opening, the famous tune, you might say, the big tune, and that in a different way, because the beginning of the Sansans is not meant to be so intense right away, sense a very long line that Sansans gave her to sing and to hear that. So just to give you a sense of the class, so it's going to be a little bit of blah, blah by me. So you just have to live through that. And then after that, we will be working with these with our students on the premise that since earlier in the week when I gave them their assignment, you might say, and asking them to work on this, that they would work on these and listening to and playing along or after these great singers and then applying that 
to their actual bassoon repertoire that they were offering. So that's, that's the technique of the class. That's the pedagogy of the class. Now, if anyone has any questions along the way, I'm happy to hear them. I won't be able to see everybody for the hand raising and stuff. Of course, if Ali notices anyone, if put it in a chat, oh, Justice is here, I see, um, that um, Ali could interrupt and just say, we have a question from somebody, that's fine. I don't mind. I I do this enough that I won't get derailed from my probably won't get derailed from what I'm talking about. So we'll get down to business. First of all, anybody have any questions thus far? Probably haven't gotten in far enough to have any. Okay, in that case, I'm going to share the screen and go to a PowerPoint. Fancy me PowerPoint uh, that presentation to to show you. Got to get rid of this first. Da, 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 de, da, da. There we go. Sometime today, I'll be with you. Get to the top. Uh, slideshow. All right. So, down to business. Um, using the vocal model to develop our voice on the bassoon, as you heard. And this, as we know, is a, presented by Mr. Leitzinger, the Leitzinger Bassoons. And, and once again, thank you to Forrest, to Cynthia, to Stefan for allowing me to be part of it. I, I, cer I certainly enjoyed Nancy Belmont's class last week. I thought that was wonderful to watch. And I learned a lot from it. Okay, so when we're singing or when we're playing through the instrument, we have to keep uh, a consistent air column. If we had more time, I would talk more about getting a good breath. But for today, we will uh, talk about making a sound with and jump ahead of taking a breath, although it's a very important part of the process. So you will see here these two parallel lines, and they are to, to indicate a consistent air stream. And when we play, or when you take a breath, if you look here at this clock without dial, without hands on it, in the lower part of the screen, if one thinks of being out of air at six o'clock more or less and breathing in until 12, and then breathing out again from 12 to six. So what we need to, if we take a breath in normal life, you might take, even if you took a big breath and you took a breath and you went, if you just let it out without supporting it, the air will come out very quickly and then diminish. In other words, we must use our musculature, our abdominal muscles, basically all the muscles of our midsection, not just abdomen, but all the way around in order to, um, in order to act upon our diaphragm to keep a consistent air stream. So, I like to think, and this came from my teacher, we like to think that if you just go, it's like you've let go immediately of the initial air. For instance, now you're sitting and listening to me and you only have to cycle a tiny bit of air in order to keep awake and alive. You're not using a lot of air due to physical activity where you would need to have more oxygen to keep running or doing some sport nor are you right now playing the bassoon or blowing up a balloon where you have to keep a consistent stream of air to accomplish something. So this is the, the air we're used to just getting rid of either a little bit or even a little bit more. So what we like to think is we need to use this reserve air, reserve air. And that comes from, it's part of how you use your support to maintain a uh, consistent air stream. And I found online, and this should work uh, because I already said it, we'll find out. Um, this was a very good demonstration of how the diaphragm works. The primary muscle of respiration is the diaphragm. The diaphragm is a thin dome-shaped layer of muscle and tendon that separates the abdominal cavity from the chest cavity. 
It gains its shape from its attachments and from the organs that surround it, especially the heart, lungs, and liver. The diaphragm attaches at the costals along the lower rib cage, high in the front at the sternum, and deeply in the back along the spine. The diaphragm also attaches to itself via a central tendon, making the diaphragm one of the unique muscles of the body. The diaphragm uses its central tendon and its attachments as leverage to flatten during inhalation. The expansion of the ribs comes from the resistance of the internal organs to downward movement. As the internal organs are slow to move, the ribs expand to make room for the lungs. While the diaphragm attaches at the bottom of the ribs, its range of motion never reaches that low in the body. As seen from below, we get a sense of the full range of motion of the diaphragm as it would glide over the aorta, the vena cava, the esophagus, and the internal organs. For more information, the primary muscle, the primary of, muscle of the diaphragm is the, the diaphragm. diaphragm is a thin, dome-shaped layer of muscle and tendon. Sorry, that happens. <laughs> when I try to change slides, it'll sometimes do that. So uh, I apologize for that. Uh, let's see if I can get out of here. More, uh, come on now, stop it. The primary muscle of respiration. Okay, finally, I apologize for that. I'm gonna go out of the chair for a minute and just talk a little further about this breathing. So that's an, I found that to be a very good depiction of the diaphragm. It's, I'm not a doctor. I understand certain things about it, but it seemed to me to be a very good way of explaining that it's that the motion of that diaphragm that allows us to get a good breath. And also we then have to act upon that diaphragm to get it to do what we want in order to make a sound, to expel air. Now, I'm not gonna go into too much detail about the breathing in, as I said, but there's a very good exercise, speaking of opera singers, that um, was, it's common among singers, but uh, often it's someone that used it in master classes was a wonderful soprano, Montserrat Caballé. And it's um, where you, some of you may be familiar with it, but it really works great. If you think of pursing your lips like you were gonna sip, you know, like you had a straw, I guess, or you were just making sure the, cough, the tea or the coffee's not too hot. And you breathe in, I want you to try it. Oh, Shelly Monroe can give us an example right there in the, with her cup of tea, very well done. And so, um, thank you, thank you. Dr. Monroe for your help in this. So um, the idea is this, if you take a breath, if you take a breath with your lips barely open, like you were sipping, you will be creating resistance, right? For pulling in the air. And as you do it slowly, notice what part of your body you are using physically to create enough energy to pull in the air and notice how your body will fill up from the bottom up, right? This sort of diaphragmatic breathing we talk about. So just try it. It's easy enough to try just where you are. If you just go. You notice if you breathe that way, it's very hard to breathe into your chest right away, right? Everyone is told, don't just breathe into your chest, right? Who's heard that before? Oh, oh, me, 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 right? So we don't go, we know that's not the way to do it, right? We know that. So the question is, okay, that's, I shouldn't do it, but how do I learn to do it correctly? So that's one exercise that's really quick to describe that will help you to feel that expansion in your midsection, you might say, to allow you to get a good breath. Now, the reason you want to get a good breath is, of course, the more air you have to use for playing is better. The other reason to get your breath properly is it will set you up to support that air column when you play out, right? When you actually play. Now it's from first, this sipping exercise is from six to 12 on the, on the um, clock face, right? Now we're talking 12 to six. So here's a, another exercise, and then we're gonna stop with these exercises for now. And that is to make you feel, how you can feel the support muscles in your midsection. Now, just like I said, remember we had that res, uh, initial air and residual air on those parallel lines. If you, I want you to exhale, you might say your initial air stream and get to a low point. 
and then without breathing in, blow some more vigorously. And note like you were blowing out candles on a cake or trying to blow up a balloon, even though you didn't have too much air in your body. And notice what part of your body expel, helps you to expel the second blast. Make sense? I'll show you what I mean. So try it. Let's give it a try. All right. On the second blast, where did you feel it come from? Let's maybe we'll ask some of our participants. Annabelle, where did you feel it from? I saw you were trying it. Um, like my abdominal muscles. Good. And Sophia, did you notice anything else or was that pretty much the same for you? That was pretty much the same. Yeah. Right. Did anyone notice their lower back muscles? What we call in English the small of your back, right? And, and so when you use, so try it again and notice that you don't only use, you don't only, only set your abdominal muscles, which was absolutely correct. And that is the answer I would, unless someone's heard my spiel before, 95% of the time, the answer that Annabelle and Sophia gave would be the answer that I hear. And so it's, it is correct, but it's not the whole story. That's all. So try it again and notice if you feel those lower back muscles integrate as you continue exhaling the second blast. So try it again. Do you feel how your abdominal muscles set and your lower back muscles push in, kind of push forward almost through your body? That's support. That's support. And I'll show you one more thing. If you, you know, how many people have been told, don't raise your shoulders when you play? Oh, oh, me, 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 right? <laughs> now put your shoulders up and try that same exercise. Put your shoulders up, exhale twice. <sighs> Could you get the second blast out? Almost no, right? It didn't want to come out. So in other words, posture, how you sit or stand, keeping your shoulders down, all of these things affect your ability to create a, a solid airstream in uh, creating a sound on a bassoon or anytime you need a consistent solid airstream. Okay, so now let me think, where do I want to go? Now, each note on the instrument has a resistance. And if when we you remember the clock face, six to 12, 12 to six. If I just breathe in six to 12 and play immediately, I, this is not what we usually do. I don't think you'd probably agree. You don't go. <laughs> that was I breathed in and I immediately let go right away, right? <laughs> no, what do we do? We set first, whether you're thinking about it or not, you do. So you could think I'm going to breathe in till 12 and set until one or two before I come in. And what are you doing during that time? Shoulders down, your abdomen is lightly uh, flexed, you might say, initiated, and you're getting your lower back set. Right? So you set. And a good way to practice that even we may get to this again later, is you can practice a non-tongued attack. I don't even like to say breath attack because if anyone, well, you have some young people here, but when you have little kids, you try to teach them the clarinet or the flute and you say, you know, tongue the notes and all, they kind of go, right? Something like that. To me, that's an air attack, right? Because they don't know from support their little kids. And so they just kind of blow into the instrument, right? So what we're saying is not just the air, it's the support, it's the intensity of the air column behind the air column, right? The, the support behind the air column, that is essential. So you can practice without tonguing uh, the notes. So I call it either an untongued attack or a support attack. Integrate your support with overcoming the resistance to make the note speak. <laughs> So those were untongued and you could even maybe hear a little air go through before it came in because I was finding the spot where I have overcome the resistance of the note. 
And some of you have seen, I even made a video, but I didn't include it today because I don't want to go too much longer and leave plenty of time for our players, is if you think of moving a heavy object, I also put this in the new Weissenborn. If you, um, if you, I, I, my video would be, I'd be standing by the piano. And this comes from my dear teacher, Mr. Maxim. If you want to move the piano exactly a, li a little tiny bit or have control over literally sl uh, rolling the piano, sliding the piano, what do we do? We lean up against the piano. We feel its resistance, its weight. In the case of piano, it's heavy. It's opposed to a breath, you know, a barometric dif difference, air pressure difference. And then if you're leaning against that piano, if it's going to move, you can just lightly push it if you want. Or if you really wanted to, you could shove it. But if you stood away from that piano and hadn't yet established its weight and resistance, your ability to move that piano precisely would be quite hampered, would be hindered. Makes sense, right? From far away, if I did it, I'd just go like that and probably hurt my, the palms of my hands and maybe move the piano. But if I'm leaned up against to, if I'm supporting against that piano, just like supporting against the airstream, I can then move it as I wish, right? Move the air column, move the sound as I wish. So those are the concepts I wanted to, to uh, share with you. And then we're going to go into some other, other things. Any questions before we move on? You could even speak up if you have one because we can't see everybody. No, okay, then off we go. Back to this share, screen share. Okay, now we're going to talk about what is a great sound. And the title of this area, resonance and the definition of a proper tone. And this is what I suggest you do. Uh, it's great to listen to beautiful bassoon sounds. Nothing wrong with it, especially for young players. You have to understand what the bassoon is supposed to sound like. I remember when I brought it home, the first day I played the bassoon and had my first lesson, I came home and I put it on the kitchen table and I played some notes for my mom. And my mom's question was, Frankie, is it supposed to sound like that? So, and to this day, sometimes when I'm playing, I hear my mom saying, is it supposed to sound like that? But anyway, uh, when you're older and thinking about really finding the optimum sound, the fact is great sounds have certain share, certain essential traits, whether it's a piano sound, a bassoon sound, a flute, a tenor, a soprano, a violin. A, all instruments will have a certain almost fingerprint or cell structure of qualities within the sound that make it beautiful. And there are ways of doing it in different schools of playing. In the case of the bassoon, the bassoon or the basson, the French bassoon, it's, it's not, uh, nobody has ownership to this. There's no school that has ownership to this. It's just what is a great sound. And because it's good sometimes to get away from your own instrument, the idea of identifying great sounds that aren't your instrument and thinking critically about how those sounds compare will lead you to find the best sound that you can make. And you could say a great sound has focus, resonance, secure intonation, and a properly produced vibrato if you use vibrato. Um, and so and this is a, 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 a modernization, a little bit of my teacher's concept of there are three basic ingredients to a great sound, to it making a sound. Support, which we've talked about. Your, you might say, vowel position, which is your tongue position and throat. And the embouchure. And in terms of a sound, and then I'm going to show you one more little video, I guess, yeah, uh, about what I've tried to describe in, in a drawing what a good sound is. And the idea is, and this is what singers do, is voicing your sound, getting a good core in the center of your sound. If that core is up too high, you will sound pinched. And if it's too low, it'll sound flabby. And if you don't have enough core, your sound will sound muffled. 
And so we have to find that spot, that sweet spot where the sound rings. And then from that core, that provides the energy and intensity that make the sound resonate and allows the performer to give direction to each pitch, meaning inflection by direction. You're listening to me speak and every now and then I have to take a breath. And after I take a breath, I continue. I naturally, and we all do this, phrase the last, uh, you might say last syllable, the last sound in my statement before I breathe in such a way that implies to you that the phrase is going to continue. If I said to you, if I take a breath and then I go on, that sounds odd to you. And the same thing in music, same sound, the same, you would have the same reaction to a phrase or the lack of the phrase. If I say, if I, if I stop to take a breath and then continue, I left breath in such a way that you could hear that I was going to continue. And so here you'll see under here, remember the handshake. What that is, is if you imagine when using the support I've described, when you're going from note to note, you're not just um, when you're going from note to note, you're not just going like da, 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 da with your support. You're leaning into it. You're moving. Your support is moving from note to note. So if we were shaking hands right now, or it wouldn't be actually shaking, but holding hands like we were shaking, I would be demonstrating to you that I kept leaning towards you as I played the phrase, and I wouldn't be just going da, da, da like that. Okay? Let's see how much further we're going to go with this. There are many things I want to share with you, but not enough time. Now, in terms of vibrato, remember that the two circles, the concentric circles, you'll notice here there's a sine wave, uh, you know, kind of going through the middle of this tube. And if you think of that picture of the two concentric circles from a few slides ago, if you set that on its end, over time it would become a tube. And we have to work to keep our vibrato in the middle of the sound. So I want to show you this, some of this clip anyway, which is a, 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 some of what it was that we just spoke about. This is already in a clip, so it makes it a little bit easier to show you. Frank, we don't see anything. Okay. Sorry about that. I forgot to reshare the screen, did I? One moment, please. It would help. Thank you for warning me. That's, uh, hold on. Let me get out of here. Let me get back to here. Share the screen. Between that, we can't hear you. You're on mute and your screen froze, right? Those become three of the most popular phrases in the, in the, the world. Sorry about that. Thanks for warning me. I appreciate it. Okay, here we go. This time you'll hear it, I think. Is that okay? This particular tuning app, which is called Tunable, T-U-N-A-B-L-E, quite inexpensive to put on uh, smartphones and devices, other devices, will really show us um, what I've been talking about in terms of uh, the placement of the focus of the sound, the core of the sound, and ultimately the use of vibrato, and of course, intonation. Uh, right now, because I'm speaking, the white line is obscuring the green, but as you might imagine, the green in the middle means you're in tune. From how you're looking at it, to the right-hand side would be, would be being sharp, to the left-hand side being flat. Now, if we talk about a well-formed sound with the circle in the middle, then what I'd like to do is get that white line down the middle of that green section. And if I were to use vibrato, I'd want to get the squiggle, you might say the sine wave down the middle as well. So it's a great visual representation of putting uh, your vibrato in the right place. If 
But going back to sound for a moment, um, it's possible to make the tuner happy, but not make a good sound. For instance, I'm going to try this. I'm going to play with very little support or no support, as little as I can get away with, which will make the pitch go flat. I'm then going to bite up either closing throat and or embouchure to get the pitch back in tune. Now, over uh, current situation using microphones and such, the distinction may or may not be that great, but the point is, and take it from me, if we were in person together, I would be able to say, I'm right in tune. The tuning app tells me so, but you'd be saying, yeah, but it doesn't sound so good. Now I'm going to do the opposite. I'm I'll stop there. I'll stop there for today because I give a few more examples, but just to save some time. So the point is we need to know, we have to learn how to properly balance the support, throat and tongue position and embouchure to create that core in the sound in tune. And when using vibrato, if you're using vibrato, that that vibrato is in the middle, in the middle of your sound. Okay, I'm going to share again. Now, next. So now we're down to the, the, the real meat and potatoes of the class. Our instrument is our voice, and we must treat it as such. For the purpose of this project, what we've done is we seek out an aria or other work that seems to relate to the music of your choice. And I, I made those choices in this case for our participants. And I suggested, I gave them written instructions along these lines also, as well as speaking to them in some cases, listen repeatedly to short sections of the aria and then try to copy the singer. It's not about interpreting at this point. It's about trying to impersonate the singer, copy the singer, and don't even do a long section listen carefully and try to see how to f kind of walk in their shoes. Jazz players do this by learning solos by great artists like Charlie Parker or Coltrane and or Miles Davis. And But they're not going to spend their lives just playing Charlie Parker solos. But by practicing and trying to learn how these giants interpreted or improvised in their case especially, uh, helps you to learn. And so we're doing the same thing with sound and singing. And then, like I said, don't concern yourself when you switch over from the aria to the piece of music, your bassoon repertoire. Don't worry about anything being a perfect interpretation. Just sing and see how it feels to do that. Uh, don't. And my concept is don't worry so much about what's coming out of the instrument. Think about what you put into it. If you're thinking to voice your sound properly and move from note to note in the way that we've been talking about using both your ear and, un and physical understanding of your production, then the right sound is going to come out of your instrument. So, um, and transcend the instrument. Don't have any preconceived notions. We're not going to listen to Anamafo today, but if you want to hear incredible singing, on, you can find this on YouTube, Spotify, all that stuff. Find Anamafo and Leopold Stokowski uh, orchestration doing the Rachmaninoff vocalese. You, you won't believe how beautiful that is. So we're gonna. I'm gonna. Before we start with the kids, I'm going to uh, just share with you three minutes of the Dichterliebe of Schumann. And the interesting thing about that was. Uh, I like, as I say, I like to, and uh, I've studied, listened repeatedly to Fritz Wunderlich's recording of it over the years, um, sometimes just for fun, sometimes for educational purposes, you might say. Um, and uh, just back to Leitzinger bassoons for one second, that I had such an affinity for this instrument uh, in these last years. One time in conversation with Mr. Leitzinger, we came to realize that we both love Fritz Wunderlich and we love his recording of the Dichterliebe. And it made me think that some of the reason that those of us who are in love with these instruments feel this way is 
there's a certain sound concept, a certain feel, a certain way of playing on the instrument that is, is related to the chef, the man who cooked up the bassoons, and that's Stefan Leitzinger. So I'd like, if you don't mind, to share a little bit of my own efforts. It's like with my, my dear wife, Bethany, uh, in our living room. This recording we made a few months ago. Uh, hopefully I can find it real quickly. I'm going to re-share and I can get out of here. Sorry, let me get out of here. Get out of here. Uh, uh, all right, sorry, I'm going to stop sharing again and get rid of the, the slideshow because otherwise I, my brain is just not capable of uh, doing so many things at once with this computer. So just give me one second, please, and I will find the... Uh, the, the links, and then uh, we'll be in shape here. I'll reshare it. Let me just get to my right page and save you the aggravation of watching me <laughs> go around in circles. Um. Okay. Uh, Schubert is here. Okay, one moment, and I'll be right with you sometime today here we go So I encourage you, thank you, I encourage you to do this kind of practice. First of all, there's nothing more beautiful than to sing Mozart arias or Bach or Schumann or Schubert or, for that matter, Duke Ellington and Cole Porter and George Gershwin, uh, to sing this music um, 
and uh, think of treat your instrument like it's the human voice. It is. It is. In fact, it is your voice. It is your voice. It is not just a piece of equipment and you must treat it like your voice. You must use it like your voice, even when you're playing really fast music. But especially, of course, for obvious reasons in lyric, lyrical passages, right? In lyrical music. So for that reason today, I asked our participants to choose slower music for two reasons. One, because of what I just said, and also when the music is going by more slowly, it's a little less distracting from just the pure production, you know, getting it out point of view. So we can, we can dwell a little bit. We can think about the sound we're making. So I think we were thinking that Sophia, you're doing Weber, right? And Annabelle is doing Sansas and Justice is doing David. I think the way I was thinking of it was maybe could we start with the, um, well, it doesn't really matter, the, the Weber, I think, right? Or did I say the opposite to you? Because I'm possible. Yeah. What do you think, Sophie? You ready to go? Yeah, sure. Okay. So we'll do that. Then I would say Justice and then Annabelle. Annabelle's doing Sansans. So I guess you could say we'd be going in a chronological order. From, from Weber to David to, to Sansans. Now, the interesting thing about Weber is, you know, I like to point out is both Weber and Hummel have or have a connection to another famous composer who wrote a very famous bassoon concerto, and that's Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. Weber was a cousin of Mozart's through marriage. Weber was a cousin to Constanze, Mozart's wife. Hummel, Mozart was aware of Hummel as a child as a great talent and in fact taught him for a while. I believe he even lived in the Mozart household for a while. So it's amazing to think that we have three, the three biggest, you might say, most uh, known, best known, there are some other really good ones, concertos of that era, but uh, have a connection to Mozart. And uh, that's a, a factoid that has almost very little to do with what we're talking about. But I just love that concept. <laughs> so I'd like to share it with you. Um, good. So, Sophia, I asked you to work on I'm getting all wrapped, wrapped up with many wires here uh, to work on the Weber. You, you suggested Weber Concerto second movement. And because the Weber starts right away, uh, making a leap up in that kind of singing line and appoggiatures, I thought a good example, speaking of Weber and Mozart, for that would be the aria, the first, the, an aria from the Magic Flute, Die Bildnis ist bezaubend schön, which is sung by the tenor uh, in the first act. Uh, it's where he's, we're not going to go through that much of the aria, but it's where he's shown a picture of who is, will immediately his beloved. And he's saying it's enchanting, it's bewitched. He's seen her picture and of course, that's it. He's been, uh, he's been smitten, you know, Cupid's arrow has gone through him. He sees this beautiful, uh, woman, young woman in, in this picture. So, um, so you practice, you listen to Fritz Wunderlich, mm -hmm. right? And you uh, played along with him or after him. What did you notice about listening to him and then trying to copy him? What did, what did you notice about it? Did um, it make you do anything differently or? Yeah, it made me really think about the music differently. Like it's more of a horizontal direction. Like the air moves like forward and it's like really as you said earlier like the notes are interconnected even though like there might be rest here and there but it's like still like a continuous idea forward yeah that's exactly right i think i i would agree with you i mean there are many there are other ways you might re respond to my question but i certainly agree with that one i certainly agree with that one 
And so what I often do for, uh, um, well, first of all, probably, let me see how easily I can get back also to, I'll be back with you in a minute here, I hope. Uh, get back to the, uh, my list of, of the, um, well, that's links for Schubert and Handel. And then I have a link for the, uh, for Wunderlich's recording. And if I can get there quickly, we'll, we'll use it. Let me see. There's those two. I had it before, of course. Too many things on my, uh, here we go. All right. I'm going to share the screen yet again. We're going to listen a little bit and then we're going to come back and do some, we'll do some, some playing. So we're doing D buildness. There might be a commercial first. I apologize. Oh, maybe, oh, maybe not. Might get away with it. Hello. Hold on a minute. Sorry. I'm going to stop sharing and make sure that the, uh, there we go. Okay. That's the wrong one. I'll be right with you, he said. Famous last words. Okay, let's hope for the best. Again, my apologies. Zoom is not always uh, totally reliable. So tell me if you can hear this. I think you'll be able to. going to listen one more time then I'll, I'll unshare the screen notice how he connects in the first interval from the deep buildings, right that's six and how he and then when he gets to he fearless he says i'm feeling it i feel it i sense it that appoggiatura remember in italian appoggiati is to lean how he leans into those notes so we'll listen to this one minute again and then we'll get to Sophia.
Okay. Of course, we could listen to that beautiful singing all day, but this is not a listening class in Fritz Wunderlich, although it could be voice. Now, the other thing is, you might say, you notice I'm picking the male voices. The reason I do is that core of the sound that we want to get on the bassoon is basically that tenor voice. And when you hear great baritone sing, I, I played for 27 years, uh, first bassoon in New York City Opera, the second opera company in New York. And when you hear a great baritone singer or bass, they have within that sound that part of the sound, that tenor part. It's not just all a deep, dark sound, nor, of course, would it all be a up there. Obviously, it wouldn't be much of a baritone. The tenor, of course, is pitched higher and so is, is higher up in that frequency range. It's absolutely like we're listening to Jesse Norman later for the Sun Sons. It's absolutely okay to listen to female singers, but I just find in terms of the construct of the sound, it's easier to identify a cross in the same octave. But that by no means, just like I said, you could, I mean, you could listen to Ella Fitzgerald. Do you want to learn how to sing and how to carry a line? Listen to Ella Fitzgerald sing. So it, it, it's not limited to uh, male or female or even to style of music making, you know, uh, genre of music. So, so when you, when you practice this opening line out of the, the Mozart, how did that feel to you? What, what, did, what came to you? The things you already had some very good points to make. Anything else or just play now? Um, definitely need a lot of support. <laughs> Right. Make that smooth jump. Yeah. And remember the handshake. And in anything in, in music, the so if you have a problem or a challenge, whatever that challenge is, the solution most of the time we're talking production wise, or even sometimes interpretively, a lot of that solution, if not the whole thing, comes before the moment of the problem or the challenge. So like you say, you need that support in advance, mm -hmm. right? So it's how do you prepare to do that interval, not just make sure you lunge into that interval when you get there, right? Mm -hmm. That's what you notice. Cool. All right. Play a few notes and play us the opening of the, of the Mozart. Please. Nice, beautiful job. First of all, um, the uh, you still have original sound on, right? It should say "turn off original sound" on your screen, right? Yes. Okay, good. So, I thought the that open. First of all, the whole thing was quite beautiful. By the way, these two young ladies are both going to be seniors, right? You'll be seniors in high school. Mm -hmm. Yikes! How did that happen, right, Miss Monroe? How, how did that happen? They're seniors going to be seniors in high school. Anyway, we've known them for a while, so uh, it's fun to watch them grow up. Anyway, two very intelligent young women, too, very hard working in school and on their instruments. And um, anyway, the, you play it very beautifully. What I like especially is, even with the you know, difficulties of listening over Zoom and all that, I could hear how you were getting a nice ring on each note. I felt like the quality of sound did continue from note to note. Now, the spot that I could suggest is right, we call that a leading tone on a downbeat. 
right? Mozart, Salier, uh, um, De Ponte was Mozart's librettist, although not for the magic flute. But he and but De Ponte wrote that it was Schikaneda wrote the the libretto for uh, the magic flute. Anyway, uh, get I'm throwing in music history, no extra charge. I think it's a pretty good deal. You're getting a great deal. It's special. Special pre Fourth of July holiday weekend uh, special. Anyway, De Ponte wrote that Mozart could set his write his words to music as fast as he could write the words. It's not a surprise. He goes, "Ich fühle es." I feel it, right? I feel this reaction. He's responding to the intoxication of seeing this beautiful young lady's picture, right? That's what's great about opera. These things can happen like that. So Mozart knew this. He put that kind of an expression in compositionally on that note. So play me just the B natural first. That's the... Do it like this, in fact. Good, good. Make sure at the end. Oh, one other of my favorite uh, drawings, and sometimes in, when I'm on Zoom in the days of Zoom, I put into my slideshow. If you think of a diminuendo, you know, the marking, the two lines come together, a V on its side, right? Mm -hmm. If you think of that, like you two are in, taking science, advanced placement, all that stuff. They're working this summer at a lab, the two of them getting doing internships at a lab, very smart people. I'm afraid to talk to them because they're too smart for me. But anyway, so I'll, I'll do my best. Hopefully I don't get in trouble. If you think of these two lines as, as if they were on a graph in math class, and the upper line is the amount of air going through the bassoon is reducing, is diminishing. At the same time, your support intensifies. I don't want to say it goes up, even though the line goes up, because you might go, up, like push up, but it intensifies those lower back muscles and abdomen, which we talked about an hour ago. Mm -hmm. Right? So when you're going from the B natural to the C, you do the handshake, keep your lower back in there and reduce the amount of air. And I bet you you'll even have better control. Try it. There you go. So now you have to get to that B position from the E flat, right? So you have to be planning for that physically. Try that. you go yeah and let's finish out the line then we're going to skip to the Weber actually we're going to stop there even though that's not the whole line do that please Beautiful, beautiful. Hate to stop. The music is so beautiful. It's painful to stop. And you're playing it very beautifully. So now, are you doing anything a little differently than before you and I started? Is there anything new to be thinking about? I think like more focus like on the back 
muscles too yeah in addition just to using like the core the abdomen it's like the back is also like very important in helping generate that support you got it you named it and i'll tell you i teach i don't teach usually people your age but i often say i teach students from 18 to 28 from all sorts of schools almost there isn't it's they make fun of me right shelly put your back into it right that's one of the famous Morelliisms. And my teacher used to say the same thing, corners in, put your back into it, like uh, all the way through my, to the, from the first lessons to the last few times I had enough nerve to go and play for him when I was already uh, in the profession and had enough nerve to go back and play for him, uh, which was a daunting thought. But anyway, he was telling me the same stuff. These are important concepts. So now let's, let's go over to Weber. And so, as I said on the slides, and what I would say to students, when I first started doing this in, with teaching, I was using the very literal Mozart aria, Mozart concerto, Mozart aria, you know. So, um, we're going a little further afield, which is perfectly great. Um, but, so what I would often say is, play the Mozart aria and then go immediately into the um, concerto as if it were the next notes in the aria. In other words, you're not now playing the Mozart concerto. You're not now playing the Weber concerto. You're playing the next page of the Mozart aria. Like you turned the page and there it was, mm -hmm. right? So I'd like you to just, we're not worried, like I said, about the perfect interpretation or something like that. First of all, you'll get, if you sing from note to note, you already have a great interpretation. Then you could decide, I could have gone a little faster or uh, maybe gotten a little softer here or there. But I call this kind of singing from note to note interior phrasing. Remember, we use the terms crescendo, decrescendo, or the marking crescendo, decrescendo. That is a superficial thing. There are a thousand things you do when you see that. You might change your vibrato. You might change the intensity of the sound. You might get louder. You might change your articulation maybe a little stronger as you made the crescendo. You're not a machine. You're not just going to play softer. Then you're going to play louder. Then you're going to play softer. Then you're going to play louder. That's not what we do. Thankfully, they wouldn't need us anymore. They really could replace us with machines. Mm -hmm. But that's the human element. That's what you bring to it, your humanity. And when you're singing from note to note, you know, like we said, the term from the heart. I mean that from my heart. Or like I'm talking to you right now. I hope it sounds, I am sincere. I imagine I sound sincere. Part of that is the way I'm talking to you. The way I'm phrasing my words. Sounds like this is someone that cares about what he's telling you. I would like to think. Right? Mm -hmm. So when you play, you communicate with the listener the same way. Boy, Sophia, you played that note and it just, you melted my heart. That to me is the best compliment. When someone says, boy, you have a great double tongue. That's nice. That's a party trick. Look at me. I could juggle four balls at once, you know, and that's great. You got to be able to do that. But the thing that I appreciate if someone says, oh, that was so beautiful. I felt like you were singing or you brought a tear to my eye or something like that. That to me, I feel like, oh, I accomplished something. I connected with a listener, right? Mm -hmm. That to me is the answer. Okay. Now that your read is nice and dry from me talking too much. Let's hear some of the vapor. Play a few notes, make sure it works. Was beautiful. When I hear people like you, I think to myself, boy, I'm glad I'm an old man. I don't have to compete. When I think of how I played when I was your age, 
I'm glad that I'm not your age. <laughs> That's all I can say. That's beautiful. And this is a tricky passage. I'm sure people out there, some of my older colleagues, it's an odd phrasing. It kind of keeps going. It doesn't round off simply four bars, two bars up, two bars down. It kind of keeps moving. And I felt you really accomplished that, that you kept a good thread, a good tension going from the first note to the last. That's an accomplishment in that, that particular opening because it is tricky. I'm sure there are other people there that know what I'm talking about. It, it's like I said, not so simple, up and down, you know, classical arc. We're gonna stop in a few minutes. The one thing that uh, along the line, similar to like we did talking about the uh, Pagiatura. Uh, where was, let's see, it was, you want to leave that up you think like there's a question mark on that and that's where you can use that idea of putting more back into the sound as you come to an end on it you know i like i use the example of that inflection is like of course you young ladies i know you're very good people and good daughters but if I, you know, I'm Papa Frank, if, if you came home and I said to you, Sophia, do you know what time it is? You might go, uh oh, I think I was supposed to be home sooner. If I said, Sophia, do you know what time it is? <laughs> it's the same words, except you would be thinking one is, oh, it's uh, four o'clock, you know, whatever. The other one is, uh oh, what did I do? Right? So inflection, tone of voice with the same notes, the same words can make a difference, right? So, so try, I want you to try one more time and be focusing when you're coming to the end of any section, either that you're going to take a breath or just finishing a note that you're thinking about that lower back and abdomen. And then we're going to skip on to justice. people could hear the difference in that little tiny things she played beautifully the first time so it can't be like oh that was bad and oh now finally it's good you played too well the first time so that means we have to look for those special things that we can use to further improve it but that's really beautiful playing thank you so much you're welcome well i mean i don't mind you don't even have to thank me i'm just reporting you the news <laughs> reporting you my reaction and not even complimenting you. I'm just telling you what I heard. But you're welcome. I'm happy to be able to, to say that. So, oh, all right, I think I have a feeling I know where Justice is because, oh, there you are right now. I saw your name. I moved my scroller around and I, you know, I see. Hello, Justice. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. All right, play a couple of notes because we didn't get to meet earlier. Make sure everything's all right. Okay, 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 okay. You have to... Turn down the volume on your mic and make sure you have uh, the original sound on and background noise off or low. Okay, is uh, let me turn it Yeah. Okay, we're good now. Yeah, thank you. So, Justice, as I mentioned, was talking about the uh, about Ferdinand David uh, Concertino, uh, which starts as concertinos do with a slow movement <laughs> followed by a fast movement. What it is is basically a concerto without the sonata allegro movement, right? That's basically what a, a, a concertino is, more or less. Weber on Dante in Hungarian Rondo is actually a concertino, as and of course then other pieces entitled title concertino like by Crusell and Calivoda and you know other people 
Anyway, um, it's a beautiful, slow, romantic movement. David was uh, tied with Mendelssohn, right? Felix Mendelssohn. David knew the circle of, I think, Schumann and Brahms. And um, Brahms definitely knew him, met him as a young man. He was a violinist. I think he was the first to play the Mendelssohn Concerto, if I remember properly, from my student days. Um, so that's the period of David. And this, this concertino, you easily could have used the same aria that we just did, but I thought for variety's sake we'd choose a different uh, Mozart aria. And so let's see, I'm going to try sharing the screen and hope for the best uh, that it's going to play this time. We'll find out. So here's the big, the Dalla Sua Pace is from Don Giovanni. Listen to that one more time. I always think of that as a golden sound. It's just the most incredible quality of sound. So uh, if you noticed how, just like we were pointing out in his uh, the other aria, many aspects of it were similar. How he can move, like in the first phrase, he's going down an arpeggio, yet there's a sense of forward motion all the time. And of course, near the end, how he sets... <laughs> <laughs> of course, he sings the right notes, not the wrong notes. But anyway, apologize for that. That he is setting all the time and moving. What did you notice, uh, Justice, in, in listening and then playing back at him, so to speak? I feel like even before you got into the whole like, diaphragm thing, I, I could tell like when I first listened to it, he did sing from like a deep like, part like of his like stomach and ab muscles. Um, he kind of digs into the notes in a way. So, like, like the first note, he kind of went like, like yeah. <laughs> and um, that last, or at um, the marking four, that second bar, like that D. That's the, the perfect fourth, D to G, right? Yeah, he, even though there's a rest, he kind of like carried it, like just the point where there's like the minimal amount of space and then into the beat natural. Exactly. So even though there are rests, the phrase may very well continue. There are times, obviously, we get to really the end of your exposition. That's more like a period, end of sentence, end of paragraph, maybe even end of chapter or something. But much of the time, you're moving forward. Much of the time, yes, right? You're, that sense, and you got that sense. So uh, great. Why don't we do some work on the, the Dalla Sopace, and then we'll... We'll do some of the concertino. 
we'll play about that much of it, you know, uh, you know, for the sake of time. And also, it's better to focus in. You know, it's great to listen to the whole thing or play the whole thing, but one's attention becomes a little diluted, even if you have the time. So I think it's great to kind of focus in, which we're doing. That's my advice. Cool. All right, let's hear, let's hear uh, some of the Dalits of Pache, please. job nice job good um a lot of good things in that already again not like taking something that's not well played you're playing it quite well it's the same thing as those last notes like right these all these arias are in a register that can be quite challenging around the mid that mid-range c d e f you know, B, C, D, E, F above, you know, the second. Often I tell students even in checking out a reed or checking out an instrument that you're interested in playing, that second octave of G major, or even you don't have to play an F sharp, but you know, it's sort of the second octave of the, the, the straight, simple fingerings. does the reed or the instrument or the vocal, the setup, so to speak, you know, all of it, does it allow you to just keep going or do you run into any walls along the way, right? And often bassoons have problems with certain notes in there. That's another thing actually about this instrument that is remarkable is I find that it doesn't exist. That problem doesn't exist for me in that register on this uh, Leitzinger bassoon. But nonetheless, uh, the the concept is the same. So, uh, from the beginning, and when you're on the C, even think that you're bringing your shoulders down and together, not forward though. Like you were getting ready to pick up a heavy object. I mean slightly, not, you know, like trying to pick up the back end of a car or something like that. But just a little bit flexed. Try it. Try it from the top. Yeah, yeah. Good. Keep going. That was good. You can go right from there. Almost, you got it. I mean, it's good. I'm being, and of course, we're listening over the Zoom and the, you know, the whole thing. But just do that, even from that measure. You know, the D, D. Yeah, that's it. You're getting it. Did you feel like you put a little more lower back into that one? Perhaps it sounded like it. It really is. Like I said, especially in this year of the Zoom, my wife, who's a pianist, as you saw, but also studied bassoon with the same teacher, Mr. Maxim. She says, you said this, you were saying the same thing all day long. <laughs> so I'm teaching Zoom lessons, have saying the same stuff. And that's how it goes. That's how it goes, because those are the most important things. It's amazing, but they really are. And that's why I tend to focus on them 
in class. You know, it's one thing I could sit here and give you my opinion on how to play Scheherazade or how to play the Mozart concerto or how to play the David. But I think, I'm hoping to be of even more use to you by giving you these concepts that you can then apply overall to music, you know, and hopefully be of more benefit to you than sometimes we do want to work on something very specifically. Absolutely, that's not a, a, a bad use of time. But in these master classes, I do try to think of ways I can help you. So now, when you applied that to the David, what did you notice? Did it change your thinking? Yeah. Your approach, you know, yeah. And how? I mean, what, what did you notice? Um, I definitely noticed that um, there's a lot of like the, or the, uh, Eighth note, sixteenth note rhythm. There's a lot of the um, like you can dig into those lower note or like the lower note of it before going to the. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, let's hear some of the Ferdinand David. Uh, uh, the it's called it's an andante, andante cantabile. We'll do just the first couple of lines of the opening of the first movement. things you could do inside in terms of, of, of uh, uh, phrasing and this voicing of sounds, like in the last phrase. So what I'd like you to do is this. I want you to play four beats of the D, kind of heating it up and then the E. In other words, See what I mean, right? You know where I mean. Excellent. Now go. Almost. Now do the same thing. Add in those other notes you know, the triplets in between. But the point is that D has to be intensifying. It's leading to the E. And then it goes, instead of uh, the E natural is leading to the F, but it goes to a lower F. It doesn't go, da, da, right? It goes down. But it's the same idea of where you're heading with that note, right? So now play it as written, but really concentrate on the direction of the D to the E. Yeah. Now, that to me, that to me, um, it made a difference. Did it feel different playing it even? Yeah. yeah. In what way did it, I mean, even physically, like uh, production wise, did it change anything? I kind of like related the B natural to the E, like that jump. And then like, I just kind of felt like the, like the arpeggio kind of in like my playing, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. No, I got you. What I often find if you're supporting like that and into it, sometimes students will say, and I mean, it, your answer is correct. It's, I want you to be what you experienced. Not like I'm, no, you didn't experience that. I'll tell you what you experienced, young man. So I want to hear what you experienced. But I think that it sounded easier to play to me. I felt it sounded to me like you were more in control of it physically. That the support will make you feel more in control because you're meeting the resistance of each note. You're, it, that's how singers sing. You are voicing from note to note, which immediately both in, enhances the phrasing and uh, it enhances the phrasing and leaves you in the right place. You know, like almost like from a physical response point of view, like notes coming out, you know, on that level, as well as the actual music making, right? So let's go back to the beginning. Mm -hmm. 
Right, so we're going first to that G, right? If you put words through, it would be like, oh, how I love you, right? It would be something like that, right? Right? It would have that, because that, da, da, it's like Mozart, di, di, da. That's an important moment in the phrase. So we can think of that even when there aren't words. How would this phrase go if it did have lyrics to it, right? Where are the important notes? So try from the top again. In a couple of minutes, we're going to go over to Annabelle. Yeah, on the G, this is a habit many people have to vibrate the second note. You went and you're you're like, just join the human race. Everybody does this. So it's not like you're something wrong. It's like how we do it often. You're going to go, you're kind of going. I overdid it, but like, you know, that idea of getting to the downbeat. In the case of so, uh, Aunt Sophia was leading tone up, in your case, like a poggiatura down, right? Okay, let's try from the beginning again. Now, the only other thing I'd say, and we'll have to stop, is in the articulation. Do that once and play the 16th legato. Play the whole measure legato, no tonguing. But really sing through those 16ths, like you said you felt connected to the triplets. I mean, the arpeggio going down earlier. Really stay connected to those 16ths. One more time. Right? Now, lightly tongue them. Play as written. Re re rely more on making the sound, less on your tongue. In other words. Ah, sorry. It's okay. No, even at, no, already I'm hearing. Much lighter tongue, more use of the lower back. Good, it's getting there. That's something you can work on. Get into the sound, then add light articulation. Nice job. Thank you. Good to meet you. Any question? I think I'm good. Thank you. Great. All right. So, Annabelle. And let me see if I, once again, will get my last efforts in the line of... Finding the uh, the uh, connection, the um, all right, I'm getting there. There it is. Hold on, I'll get it up, and then I'll. Good. Let's hope for the best. I'll be. I'm not with you yet, so I haven't messed up yet. Got to uh, share again. That's what I'm in the middle of doing at the moment. Okie doke. So here we're going to skip to 
the hit tune. This is a really uh, to stop there and if you notice even looking at the orchestra I know those musicians they're members of St. Luke's it was a TV broadcast from years ago and you can see them kind of listening to her like I said about my teacher saying they would forget to play sometimes and there are times when you hear a singer an artist of that level and you can hardly keep track of what you're supposed to be doing because their music is so making it so powerful that you um uh, you just get lost in it. It's a wonderful world that we live in, music. Um, we're very lucky to be surrounded by it, very fortunate to be surrounded by it. such beauty, such talent. So, so um, Annabelle, what did you notice? I'm sure you, we notice a lot of the same things. It's not like you have to come up with something new. I just, what did you find when you listened? Obviously, she sings really slow. <laughs> so, you know, uh, which is almost Herculean in the way that she can maintain the line like that. Now, now that we're talking about support and all of that, ima imagine how much strength and con uh, con concentration that she's using in singing at such a level and putting out all that sound. It's a very different than Mozart arias. It's a different approach and not totally related to the sans-sans, which starts more dreamy than, uh, you know. Anyway, what did you notice? Um, when I listened to it, it sounded like the air kind of like never stopped. It was just a matter of how she like shaped the phrases. And um, I felt like her beginnings and ends of the phrases like really like made me notice how like meticulous it was how like delicate it was when she ended it and the taper in her sound yeah and i thought that was really impressive how she yeah it. and the fact is that takes a lot of understanding it's not just a beautiful voice which she had i got to play with her a few times i remember doing the Strauss four last songs and when she sang that I mean you just tried not to cry <laughs> try not to break down in tears and certainly sitting there with chills the whole time hearing the singing and the music is so unbelievable and hearing that level of singing and that level of music making music art it's uh, pretty astounding pretty astounding so Let's hear a little bit of this. Now, obviously, we play it lower, an octave, you know, it'd be hard to play up there. <laughs> so. Right? So.
beautiful. Beautiful. Such soul in these young players, huh? To us, such soul. It's impressive. Now, the one thing I notice is you took a lot of breaths. So if we were working together, I'd be making you do. I would. I would suggest you practice that sipping exercise, right? The get used to getting a bigger breath, because really. there because I'm trying to keep some of the brain cells that are left. But anyway, <laughs> at my age, you can't sacrifice too many brain cells to the cause of music. So uh, <laughs> like playing, they're trying to play the burial sequenza or something like that. So um, I don't mean to, I'm a show off. I'm sorry, hot dog. But the point is you can go a lot longer than you did. You have to call me Dr. Hot Dog, by the way. But that's another story. We won't go there. But uh, you can get a better breath. You have to relax. Here's a good one, too. Just to remind you about tension. Like, everyone, just take a deep breath. Just go. <sighs> now what I want you to do is clench your fist. Clench your fist like you're really angry. Right? Touch really hard together. Now, really hard. Now, breathe in. You can't get as good a breath, right? You can't. So here you are clenching your fists, not too much related to taking a breath. <laughs> but as soon as you created that tension in your body, it was harder to breathe. So part of this is also remembering to relax when you take your breath, right? <sighs> and not like that. Good. But you played beautifully nonetheless and that's okay but just that's the thing i can help you with that was obvious to me right away just from a breathing perspective let's hear the first phrase again this time really take your time to get a good breath everybody's in your corner we love the way you play right we do Get a good breath and keep going. Now you see, for everybody, because she got a better breath, she was in a better position to support so not only did you go longer, obvious thing, but your sound even had more substance to it. Did you notice that? Like your sound was fuller, right? So that's when I was saying at the beginning, although we didn't get go to everything about breathing in, getting a good breath has so much to do. Getting from 6 to 12 has a lot to do with what you do from 12 to 6. But that's beautiful. I just... I'm in love with that aria. Who can't be in love with that, right? It's hard to resist <laughs> intoxication of that music, right? Good. So let's hear some sansons now. Um, actually, what? Um, where should I play up to instead of playing the whole movement? Yeah, I'll. I well, I'll tell you. Good. I can answer that question. Let's think. I want to give you a specific. Let me get out my old part. Let's see. 
Probably will only go to about there, the first like eight, ten bars or so. I'll stop you in case, but. Okay, let's stop for a second. Just stop. It's okay. Now, a couple of things. First of all, on the way up, just like I was mentioning with Justice about really lead with the air and tongue lightly. The other thing is my teacher used to say, support shrinks intervals. So when you're on that G, really think you're going from the G to the F sharp. Right? The support going across will help you with that interval. If you kind of stop and look down, like they don't look down, <laughs> going up the mountain, don't look down. If you look down, you're more likely to stumble. Okay? Do this once. Just play G, F sharp, like that. Beautiful. Now add in the low A, but sing through to the F sharp. Up. Then you have to get back up to the F sharp, right? Good. Try it again. You're getting the idea. There you go. That's more like it. F sharp is a trickier note, so you have to make sure you find that. So what what is what is Sans Sans doing? Weber did it too. I guess David Mozart certainly. He's saying the bassoon has a baritone register, has a tenor register, even has an alto register. And Sans Sans is saying, listen how the bassoon can play a beautiful long line, but tr jump down almost two full octaves. Right? It's an octave and a seventh, so close, pretty close to a two full octaves in one line. That's one of the assets of our beautiful instrument that we can sing in all these different voices. Right? So we have to be prepared for that. So go back now one measure earlier, da 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 da, you know, eighth notes going up. Nice, nice. And don't you notice how all of this music that we've been listening to, working on, each one had this sense of having to leave last notes up and going forward, had a need to get into a note in, a, in, a, in an emphasized moment, like in a pagiatura, leading tone, right, things of that nature. Being able to negotiate octave and two octave leaps, but maintain um the consistency of phrase all of that has to is part of this concept we're talking about of voicing each note and all of that goes back to how do you voice a note using your support your throat and tongue position your embouchure right that's our that's sort of the message of the class uh and that's what we're working on let's hear this whole phrase one more time from the beginning beautiful though you're doing a great job
Nice, beautiful. So how did that feel to you? Was there a different? Yeah, it felt more connected and it was like I was leaning into the next note. Exactly. And that goes back to that idea of a handshake that you're leading to the next note. When my students would say, don't forget the handshake, that's just shorthand for keeping moving all the time, always looking out for that next note and seeing what notes, if you connect them, uh, will help you with the phrase, right? So that's, uh, that was much better. You already were getting the idea. So it's, you've been patiently listening to me for two hours. I commend you and I apologize at the same time. You all deserve hazard pay. Uh, but well, not for the last 40, 50 minutes when we listen to these beautiful young people play, that wasn't the problem. But I, I hope I didn't overstay my welcome with my explanations, but I wanted to try to share these concepts. So uh, um, maybe we'll stop there, but are there any questions about anything related to the class or anything you'd like to ask me? I'm uh, happy to, to listen and to try to explain. Any questions? I saw a few things go by in the chat. Looks like more or less they got covered, but you tell me if there's something you want to know about, you can let me know. Um, I have a question. Uh, so when you're like breathing through your diaphragm, like I've been told that you need to feel like you're like, I guess, um, stomach like expand. Um, but I feel like when I try to do that, like, I feel tension, like there's resistance, like I can't get enough air. All right. One thing you could, well, first of all, that sipping exercise will help. The one from earlier. Another thing you can do is also remember, oh, two things. One is in terms of posture and tension. If you sit, for instance, if you sit too straight up, if you arc your back and try to get a breath, you'll find, like in other words, if you're really sitting up super straight and your back sort of curves in a little bit, people try that and then try to get a breath. It tightens up, right? It's harder to get a breath. If you slightly cool, uh, relax your, your, I would say kind of change your butt bones a little bit, you know, like just move your hips down a slight bit. Now try to breathe again. That was easier, right? Did you notice? That's like finding that proper uh, position sitting or standing to help you get that good breath, to relax your abdomen as you breathe in. Even though I'm talking about support and using an abdomen, abdominal muscles, if you have them tight when you breathe in, you won't get a good breath. For instance, if you flex your tummy muscles right now, make them hard, and try to breathe in, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's like your sister, Vina, you have her right there. If you were wrestling or something, she held you around the belly. You say, I can't breathe. Let me go, right? Like when you're having fun or something like that. That um, because you've constricted, restricted your ability to move, for your diaphragm to move like that first video that we saw, right? The other thing you could do is if you practice lying down and you think of one hand on your belly and one hand on your chest, and first really as you breathe in, relax, try to raise that hand that's on your belly. That doesn't mean like hold down your chest, but don't allow yourself to go just straight up into your chest. You know, you want to try to first get your belly to expand and then into your chest. Sophia, when you did the longer breath on the, oh no, actually, no, it was you, Annabelle. When you did the longer breath on the, the Sansans, how come you were able to go longer? Yeah, I feel like the way that I took in my air was different. And how was it different? Can you remember now? It felt like I wasn't Actually, I feel like when I was breathing before, I was trying too hard to like hold the air just in my stomach, 
But like when you said just now, um, I can like let the air also into my chest. Later. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> your chest, your lungs go from literally the top of your lungs are like under your clavicle, like your the collarbone and all the way down. And the reason we say don't raise your shoulders is you don't want to do it first. You don't want to go, <gasps> right? You don't want to do that when you breathe in. But the idea that if I take a deep breath, At the end, this expands and my shoulders go up a little bit, but that's because I've taken in a lot of air and not a physical, you know, scarecrow, you know, like being on the, like the scarecrow. That will help you, but try lying down on your bed or on the floor. Allow yourself to, you can even lie down and do the sipping exercise, lying down, because when, the, why, why lie down? Because when you're lying down, then you're not wrestling with posture trying to find it, you know, the best spot. You lie down, now you're not worrying about that anymore. So whenever you're trying to fix a problem, just like I had you leave out a note, or I had just this leave out the tonguing, the more distractions, the way to break down a problem is into its parts and try first to work on something with the least distraction or at least other challenges, distracting challenges. Like in the case of justice, I said, all right, first don't tongue the line. Let's slur the line. Let's get the sound really going that way. Now add your tongue in. I often say it's like singers. They start out the day vocalizing, ah, 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 right? Using open vowel sounds to get a good sound going. Then their problem is they have to be able to sing words and still sound good. If they could go around always going, ah, oh, it would be a lot easier for them. But they have to say words. That's like us. If we just play slow music that's legato, often we feel it's easier to get a good sound going, right, into a phrase. And as soon as we start tonguing, we start being distracted. Okay? So in this case, we're not talking about tonguing, we're talking about breathing. If you lie down, you're not distracted by having to sit up <laughs> or stand up. And you can work on that. And then obviously the obvious thing would be now take the experience of having practiced this lying down and now try it standing up without a bassoon. And then try it standing up with a bassoon and then standing up with a bassoon and play a note. You can build your way up to feeling more comfortably and then sitting down and doing. So that's my recommendation for you to, to continue to work on it. But you were able to do it much better immediately in the sansans. So it's not like you're incapable of it. You did it immediately. The very first time you tried. So you could do it. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? I know it's going late. I appreciate everyone for hanging in there. There is one in the chat, Frank, that says, do you ever breathe in through your nose? Not when I play the bassoon, no. And the other thing about that, and this may cause a little controversy in the world of bassooning, but I advocate when you take a breath to keep your bottom lip on the reed and not this, to breathe that way. And the reason for that is twofold. The main one, well, they're both important reasons. One is that the moving parts of the embouchure, the placement of the lower lip and teeth is more crucial than the upper lip contact with the reed. So I'd rather not have so many moving parts in the more important part of my embouchure. You know. Right? And secondly, I find, and this may just be because I want to think this way, <laughs> I'm willing to admit, if I drop, if I go this way, I'm cutting off a little more. If I go this way, kind of like yawning. So, so that's, that's my opinion. Now, just like anything we've been talking about today, your teachers may rec recommend other ways of doing things. There are different ways of making a read, different styles of reads, different styles of instruments, different style concepts of sound production. There's no one way to do something. There's no one way. The trick is to find the efficient, natural way that works for you. So in the things I've been talking about, that is not to imply that something else you've been told was wrong. 
And I'd say when I listen to master classes by my colleagues or they of mine, in the end we say, you know, like 95% of what you say is what I say. And often I remember with a good friend of mine, Milan Turkovich, joking about how like if he did a class for my students and afterwards they say, Milan Turkovich said this or that. And, you know, you bite your tongue not wanting to see a teacher. I've told you that a thousand times. <laughs> and he says the same thing in reverse. Oh, Frank Morelli said, you know, it's like, I've told you that a many times. You know, so, but we don't, we don't mind because these are certain truisms in music. Other things, there are different ways of doing it. Long read, short read, fat read, thin read, this bassoon style, that bassoon style. Uh, there are too many beautiful players in this world for anyone to say they have ownership of it. That's just the fact. And so I certainly am not going to be the person to say that. Um, anyway, those are some ideas. That's the answer to the nose question. Anybody else? I have a quick question, if that's okay. Oh, please. Um, I am currently working on the Romance by Elgar. And I was wondering if you had a suggestion of an aria that I could listen to to kind of apply what we did. Yeah, let's think. Well, that sans sans aria wouldn't be such a bad one, of course, because the the middle of it is super slow, but the opening has you know, aria. That's a would might be a nice one. When I I recorded the Elgar, I listened to uh, I looked at some of his other music he wrote during that time, and I think it was the Violin Concerto. Uh, it didn't give me a lot of illumination, but uh, it did help. Um, uh, let me think, what else? Da, 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 de, da, da. Maybe a little, some nice Puccini. Look into some Puccini arias, might be nice. Uh, maybe uh, from Boheme. Uh, the, uh, let me think, The uh, in the first act. It's, my brain is frying a little bit at the moment. Anyway, listen to some, check out some Puccini. You could listen to music from the era, you know, okay. uh, early 20th century, but probably more of the tonal than, you know, uh, some of yeah. the wilder stuff, although it's all good. Um, remember in the Elgar, he has many different markings. Da da dee da 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 dee da da. So I I suggest you go through it and very carefully sort of notice the different gradations of markings he uses for those different appoggiaturas and things, and try not to make them all sound the same. That's the danger of the piece. Da 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 dee da 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 da. It's after a while I've had it with the da 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 does. You know what I mean? So that's something I would study a little bit um, okay. and make the middle section sound different than the outer sections. You want to have form. It's an ABA form. So you need to get the middle section sounding a little different and more flowing. And the piano part changes too, so that you feel a sense of an ABA form. Otherwise, it sounds a little meandering. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So those are things I would that's, I mean, I'm just sharing with you what I had on my own mind when I was working on the piece. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You're, you're welcome. You're welcome. Good luck with it. Yeah. It's a beautiful little piece. I always say there's about 20 minutes of decisions in a five minute piece. That, that piece. There's like 20 minutes of decision making and five minutes of music. So he, he does put you through your paces, in my opinion, from an interpretation point of view. You got the answer, man. This is your chance. We're good? Well, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for listening. Thank you to Forrest and thank you to Stefan Leitzinger and Martina, his wonderful wife. And uh, I encourage you. There are, like I said, there's not only one kind of bassoon. But I encourage you to check out those vocals that Forrest has and the instruments if you have the opportunity. There are, and the point of finding out about instruments and vocals is to try stuff and see what works for you. Shelly Monroe, who is here, Dr. Shelly Monroe Juan, 
has a Leitzinger bassoon. She has a Model 2. I prefer the Model 1. They're both great. And sometimes when Mr. Leitzinger has showed up with some new Model 2s and I play and I think, ooh, I like this bassoon, you know, ooh, you know. But I still love my own. But my point is, in other words, there's, it, you know, there are, you have to find what works for you. And if it's a different brand, it's a different brand. But uh, I highly encourage you. I put down two really great Heckel bassoons to play on this Leitzinger. And I play in it all the time. I don't just talk about it in a master class or play it at the IDRS convention. I play it 52 weeks a year. And uh, I love it. It's a beautiful sound, a beautiful response. So uh, check them out. That's the best encouragement, best news you ever get, or best op opinion, uh, advice, I mean, is you should check them out. Check out different things if you're looking in that direction. So, anything else? We're good. Your stalwarts to have stuck in for all of this time. Thank you guys, everyone, so much for coming. If you are interested in any of the vocals, we have more than 100 in stock here. If you're interested in either of these bassoons, I have both a Model 2 and a Model 1 here in stock. Um, go ahead and give us a call. Uh, check them out on our website or... Um, we have recordings both on our website. If you go to our events page, there's recordings of both being played by the wonderful Paul Hansen. Um, yeah, they're both boy, these actual instruments. Great. He does. He, he sounds great phenomenal. He had him, I heard him on Facebook. They, no. Well, he sounds great anyway, but man, you could hear how he immediately got into them. Like they really, he could feel comfortable on them like immediately, I felt. when Because I, I know him, you know. And, I mean, he sounds great in his other instrument, but he really sounded good on those. He really yep. did, yeah. They're absolutely Thanks. wonderful. If you're interested yeah. in it, go ahead and give us a call. Otherwise, we thank you guys so much for coming. The recording of this event will be available on our YouTube channel coming in the next couple of days. Uh, if you had any questions uh, about that or about the vocals or anything you um, saw today in the classes, go ahead and give us uh, an email or a phone call and we'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you so much for coming, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.